Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us with this press briefing on the new wave of digital censorship in India. Um, just a few notes before we start. Um, this session will be recorded and we're going to put the link up on YouTube in a few hours. My name is Ria Singh Soni. I'm the Asia Pacific Policy Fellow at Access Now, and I'm joined here by several of my colleagues, uh, Ramanjit Singh Chima, the Senior International Counsel and Asia Pacific Policy Director, and Alexia Scott, the Media Manager at Access Now, who's been helping set this up. Um, before we kick off, I want to go over a few things. As I mentioned, this is recorded. We're going to run this as follows. We're going to start with um, uh, comments from my expert speakers and then open it up to questions. Uh, we really encourage the audience to ask lots of questions. Uh, if you can let us know by raising your hand, you can put it in the chat and I'll call upon you. Um, I also just want to flag in terms of uh, how we're arranging things. Uh, David um, has a flight to catch in about, in a, about half for now. Um, and so if there are any pressing questions that you want to ask, if you could indicate that early, that would be great. Um, so yeah, I'm going to introduce a great set of speakers. Uh, we've got David Kay, uh, the independent chair of the GNI and the former UN special rapporteur for freedom of speech. We've got Gayatri Kandadai, um, or Gaia, uh, the Asia Policy Regional Director at the Association for Progressive Communication. Sushant Sinha, founder of Indian Kanun and Siddharth Badrajan, founder and editor at The Wire and member of the Digital News Publishers Association. Before I hand over to our excellent set of speakers, I also want to mention that Access Now has released a joint statement today with 13 other international NGOs on the wave of digital censorship that we're seeing in India um, and you know, making specific recommendations to the government and to companies to do more to resist um, what demands are being made of them. Uh, I'm just going to hand over briefly to Raman to talk about this statement before I go on to the speakers. Thanks, Raman. Thank you so much, Ria. And I've also provided a link to the, to the joint statement in the chat here, and it's also available live online. I know many people have it. But just to reiterate, international actors tracking free expression, privacy, and other protected rights are very concerned at the limits in India. So 14 organizations, Access Now and 13 others, joined together to issue a joint position indicating that we believe that the current developments in India, both the moves towards censoring content, putting pressure on platforms to take down <laughs> content and, pro and to be able to process user requests, and more recently moves to create a significantly draconian regulatory framework for online speech under the IT rules issued under the Information Technology Act in February 2021, are likely to result in an increasingly hostile environment for free speech online not just on tech platforms, including intermediaries, social media platforms and messaging uh, services, but also digital news services that are regulated by a completely unlawful mechanism under these rules, as well as new mandates towards streaming video services and others. We therefore have called upon the government to suspend the implementation of these rules and to, uh, to in fact review them, undertaking sustained and meaningful public uh, consultation with full participation. We believe all website blocking orders that the government of India is issuing must be made available in the public domain, which they are currently not, and that they should also commit to not curtailing free speech expression, the right to association and privacy online. We also believe there are important measures that technology companies and platforms operating in India must take, which is they must uphold human rights responsibilities and mitigate any human rights harming mandates from the government of India. They must prioritize user rights and challenge any unlawful or overbroad demands by authorities. They must implement effective measures to protect privacy, free expression and security. And more importantly, they must ensure that they follow proper due procedure under law, including international human rights law standards. When it comes to assessing any requests from government agencies, they must not be complicit in censorship and they must step up. And we believe these are urgent actions that both the private and public sectors in India must take. Thanks, Raman. Um, David, I'm gonna hand it over to you first. Great. Thank you so much for, for having me this morning. Um, you know, I want to just, uh, and I'm sorry that I can only stay for a few moments. Um, I, you know, I want to start by by noting that it was um, it was just about six years ago in the Shreya Singhal case that uh, the Supreme Court of India really uh, came to a conclusion that uh, that was rooted in basic freedom of expression standards in evaluating Indian law and the possibility of censorship. Um, and I wanna start there because I think it's important to recognize 
that in both the Indian constitution and more broadly in, um, in Indian law, you know, predating the Modi government, let's say, there were strong indications that India was on a path for creating um, a kind of framework for the evaluation of regulation in India that was rooted in basic rule of law standards. And I think it's useful to start there in part because that was actually a case that was decided at, during, at, during a rights con uh, in Manila, the Philippines um, six years ago. I, I remember the, the kind of joy <laughs> that um, people were experiencing uh, at that rights con. Um, but it's useful to start there, I think, because it highlights how far India has come in the last several years. And, and I think the statement that was released highlights just that distance uh, that has been traveled by India and by this government. But, um, but it's also important to highlight a couple of those changes and at least the themes of those changes. So one, you can, you can go back several years to, um, well, not several, just a couple of years to the way in which India responded to, um, to advocacy, uh, to, um, to protest, uh, and to its own decision making with respect to Kashmir, um, where the Indian government took not just a kind of modest regulatory step to deal with the internet, but actually shut down communications across the region a couple of years ago um, and expanded its shutdown and slowdown eventually <laughs> of the internet uh, in, in Kashmir um, really for purposes of limiting communication, limiting freedom of expression, limiting the ability of people to communicate both within and without uh, Kashmir. The other kinds of issues that we've seen in the last couple of years are perfectly within that space of thinking of protest and expression as things that have to be censored rather than integrated into public policy debate. And so we see that not just in the response to Kashmir, but the response to the farmers' protests. We see that in the way in which uh, the government has responded to criticism of its COVID-19 policies. We see that in the near um, total lack of transparency around government demands to platforms and to individuals to restrict content um, uh, across the board uh, over the last several months, leading to really absurd situations where specific posts that are merely critical of government have been taken down in uh, really secretive kinds of orders issued by the government against Twitter, Facebook, other platforms. Um, and also, of course, in the broader sense, to uh, attacks on individuals, um, and that is legal attacks, often bringing cases against individuals for their expression in the country. So I think that as we think about what's happening in India, and I, I really defer to the expertise of, of others on the panel as to what is happening on the ground with respect to specific regulatory moves and with respect to the particular kinds of pressures that people are facing, I think it's useful to put the, the situation into this broader set of trends of recent years of really diminishing respect for freedom of expression after a very um, uh, kind of model kind of baseline that the Indian Supreme Court had, uh, had originally stated uh, just six years ago. So I'll stop there and, and thank everyone for uh, their patience with me and my apologies for having to uh, to leave so quickly. Thank you, thanks, David. Um, Gaia, would you like to talk a little bit more uh, about the context? Um, yeah, yeah um, thank you, David. Thank you, uh, Ria. Um, I think um, the way we could possibly 
go about it is to first sort of figure out the context because we are discussing about online censorship at a time when the second wave of the pandemic has affected the lives of millions <coughs> across the length and breadth of of my country right our broken hearts and families are still trying to piece their lives back together the extent of reliance or over reliance on digital technologies at this time has been apparent um india is one of the few if not the only country to have exclusively relied on digital technology for vaccine delivery and to a great extent even for information dissemination um the effects of that are open for us to understand and and uh, decipher what we will from social media and and digital tools have thus become sort of unwillingly or willingly central to our lives at a moment when the digital divide is so vast the pandemic has unfortunately also made way for a steep increase or normalization of violation of freedom of expression and opinion um there are two specific problems one is the targeting of speech of users and another is the targeting of platforms including digital uh, news platforms or portals um this has been made possible not only through existing legislation both offline and online specific once but also through the enactment of new legislation or rules but what i will do is i'll try and focus on the users because the other speakers will be in a better position to talk about the private sector and the impact of this on the private sector um as noted in a report by article 14 there has been sort of a significant rise in the number of sedition cases in the last decade and more specifically since 2014 this relates not only to online content but also offline content uh, this increase has been specifically noted around the historic anti caa the citizenship amendment act protest as well as the farmers protest including other important moments a lot of this has to do with content that is critical of the government its policies speech against political entities or personnel and also speech that is oddly deemed as anti national the constitutional validity of this very provision that is used to charge individuals for sedition is currently being challenged and we would have to wait to see the outcome of that but moving to content that is specific to online spaces the kinds of censorship we are witnessing includes charges for content or a post relating um or other posts that are either written or even artistic that is critical of the government and more recently critical of the government's management of the covid crisis in some cases including the state of uh, uttar pradesh seizure of property is being propounded uh, for engaging in such uh, speech so called fake speech um as has been discussed in many panels even during rights con there is very little transparency around data to understand take down requests or how these arrests are done um for instance recently instagram took down several accounts and messages relating to relief work around covid which was later termed as issues with automation or a glitch um this only confirms uh, our fears around over reliance on automation now facebook had taken down several accounts and content including that of a poet who was critical of the prime minister uh, temporarily hashtag #resign modi was uh, blocked which too was termed as a mistake now recent findings of the oversight board of facebook uh, relating to a content that claimed genocide of farmers um was which was subsequently restored was also claimed to be an error right all this points to over censorship coming from different quarters and not only the government but before all this a slew of accounts were ordered to be taken down by the government including that of caravan magazine twitter restored that account after like public outrage about it but this led to a massive fallout between twitter and the government what we need to be doing at this moment is to look at look more specifically at the information technology intermediary guide uh, guidelines and uh, digital media ethics code rules it's quite a lot so let's just call it intermediary rules for the moment um this has already been challenged by many individuals collectives companies and artists in different jurisdictions across the country uh this enactment uh, came about in february this uh, this uh, this year but is is really coming into force uh, more recently um among many other things there are three key issues of or concerns with these rules first it expands the meaning of intermediaries to include ott platforms like netflix or hotstar 
and also brings into the gambit um, digital media portals like Caravan Magazine, the News Minute. Now, these were not really included in the earlier version of the rules. Um, second, it makes it possible to trace the origin of a message, uh, breaking encryption. And third, it mandates takedown of content, failing which unilateral blocking is made possible. Now, compliance is mandatory, uh, failing which individuals or authorities of these different uh, bodies, platforms, could fail, face jail time uh, accompanied by huge fines. A significant worry with, with this addition of the rules is also the lack of effective remedy or oversight to in, in, in any way challenge these orders given the really short time frame available for compliance. I mean, the context I described earlier leaves us in a situation of severe anxiety about how these rules are going to be used and more importantly, how it is going to be used to legalize illegitimate clampdown on freedoms, uh, which only is going to result in further shrinking of civic space. Now, the problem with these rules is argued by many is not only that it violates constitutional internationally guaranteed rights, but it also violates the very act under which it was created. Uh, these rules pose a long term problem to Indians. It's not only an immediate problem because it is unclear as to how different governments, not only the union government, how different state governments are going to end up using it across the country. I mean, in my assessment, it may well come back to harm or bite the very makers of these rules uh, in different forms since, as David noted, um, this problem has been enabled by successive governments dating you know, beyond, behind, be, before 2014 even. Uh, besides this, the rules for reasons I mentioned above also defies the logic, letter and legacy of precious jurisprudence relating to rule of law, fundamental freedoms that our judiciary has evolved over decades. It really does um, break down a lot of those guarantees that we have had. I mean, another sort of external worry I have is also that these rules may end up, or rather, there's some this fear of exporting of such a model uh, to other jurisdictions, no? especially since uh, we live in a neighborhood that often draws inspiration from each other, given our so uh, common social, political, legal histories. But I mean, just to wrap up, while all this on, is on one side, another worrying reality persists, which is that while legitimate yet inconvenient speech is being actioned, hate speeches are allowed to progress in its full form. These rules do little to mitigate that. And the recent Washington Post revelations show, uh, give us a window into the operation of giants like Facebook, who have not only failed to address hate speech, it could be argued that they may well have shielded hate speech. Therefore, the argument is not that the private sector should not be regulated, but that this regulation should be um, discussed uh, in a way and, and developed in a way that is in confirmation with our jurisprudence and doesn't do harm uh, rather than remedy the situation. I think ultimately the voices that are affected by the current regulatory framework are religious and caste-based minorities, human rights defenders, women and gender diverse individuals. Essentially all voices of dissent will suffer. Thanks, Kaya. Um, I just want to pause at this point and ask if anybody had any questions for David. I, I have one and I'll, I'll start with that. Um, you know, uh, David, the Indian government's justifying the rules they've issued, you know, saying, well, other democracies have done the same. Uh, I was just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think that's a, a good point to raise and it actually tracks with what Gaia was just saying in a way that, uh, that others in the region might look to India uh, as a model as well. I mean, clearly there's a lot of, um, of problematic regulation around the world. There is, there's a kind of rhetoric in um, democratic societies right now and in democratic governments that is um, inconsistent with the idea of protecting freedom of expression and other human rights online and the Indian government is benef benefiting from that global debate. There's no question about it. Um, but, it but it's also deeply disingenuous. Um, you know, most governments, you know, particularly if we look to Europe right now and the kind of debate that's taking place 
in Brussels uh, at the European Commission around new uh, internet regulations, you know, is, uh, is relatively thoughtful. Even if we don't agree with all the particulars, it is uh, open to civil society participation. It is um, transparent to a large degree. Um, and so even if the outcomes sometimes aren't exactly what we think are consistent fully with human rights protections, um, they're proceeding in a rule of law oriented framework. And you know, for, for India to complain or to uh, explain its rules as similar to what's already been adopted uh, in, um, in other democratic countries, I think is really, um, well, it's, it's simply not true. Um, and it's, it's a reflection, I think in some ways of the reality that the government actually understands that its uh, decision-making here is out of step with fundamental uh, principles of human rights and rule of law. Um, if anything, it's a, it's a self-indictment more than anything else. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I see Devi has a question. Um, Devi, would you like to ask that? Um, yeah, hello. Hi, I just wanted to ask because both Guy and David were speaking to um, tech companies and how they have been operating in this situation. And um, we've seen many times that they've said, you know, it's glitches or their mistakes, that technical errors. And to what extent I'm thinking, should we be pushing on remedial actions where these result in rights violations? So I, I work on Southeast Asia. And for example, in Vietnam, there was this instance where they took down live streaming as, a, as the police were coming into a village and attacking villages. And that was a direct influence on, you know, what was happening in the village and um, yeah, I just wanted to pose that question as a, as a thought question out there. Well, I mean, I'll just say a word and then unfortunately I have to leave. Um, and I, I'd be very interested to hear what others think about this question, but David, it's a, it's a really good question in part because so much of our discussion around government pressure and uh, company compliance with, um, with government demands is at a level of just thinking about sort of the demand and the response. And we don't, we don't have a very uh, mature conversation about the remedies that should be available to individuals in the situations where their content is taken down or where they're subject to attack online or uh, other kinds of harms that, that might take place online um, that are cognizable as a matter of law. Um, I, I, I think you're, you're really just highlighting uh, a, a deficiency in the framework around dealing with these issues because we just so, so rarely talk about, uh, about remedy. So I'm, I'm just glad you raised the question. I, I defer to others as to how they think both the platforms um, and governments and also the international community should be responding in a remedial sense. Thank you, David. Um, I'm going to, um, yeah, I'm just going to go to Siddharth now if there aren't any more questions for David. Um, you know, maybe you could, you could build on, on what David pointed out about, you know, um, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, a little bit of your experience of how what these takedown orders have been like and how you expect digital news to be affected by these new rules. Thanks. Okay, so uh, so we have uh, at The Wire no, no direct experience of uh, takedown orders ourselves, um, either from any social media uh, company or, or any other kind of uh, uh, government directive. Uh, we have had run-ins with um, a couple of companies and politicians who file defamation cases. So traditionally, the the major form of I mean, just for uh, participants and rights con to understand, the traditional form of harassment of uh, of journalism in India, uh, because we have, as people know, uh, six seven decades of fairly robust jurisprudence defending freedom of. Uh, the press, uh, but the the one loophole uh, is defamation, 
and defamation is what was the preferred route for politicians, for governments, and for the corporate sector uh, to harass and intimidate, uh, preempt, and punish uh, media platforms for publishing stories uh, that they didn't like. So at The Wire, we've had our fair share of, of defamation cases, and uh, we have developed a mechanism to deal with these. Um, all of these cases are frivolous and uh, time consuming and wasteful on resources, money and, and time. But, um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a known devil which one is able to deal with, both uh, civil defamation as well as the more dangerous uh, criminal defamation. But what's happened over the last few years is clearly the government looking for uh, methods of harassment and methods of pressure and, and intimidation that produce a more direct uh, and you know unmediated effect. So the problem for the problem with with the establishment when it comes to defamation is that uh, the matter goes to the court. And it's the court's call, whether they grant an injunction or they don't, whether they find you guilty or they don't, whether they fine you or they don't. And uh, because the Indian judiciary uh, prides itself uh, uh, on its independence, so this is not something the executive can take for granted. So they have moved now, citing the allegedly unregulated nature of digital media into a scenario where they say we need to have new rules and, and regulations to uh, protect readers, protect the public at large, and to protect the country from the excesses of this unregulated wild west that is uh, digital news. And uh, I said this is a myth because the fact that the wire has been dragged to court, the fact that other digital platforms have, have been taken to court, uh, incidentally, not just for defamation, uh, because we've seen since the onset of the pandemic, um, the state uh, getting the police to file direct criminal charges in relation to tweets, in relation to stories that they find uh, unpalatable. Uh, and the fact that we are digital uh, provides us no protection. We are as uh, exposed and vulnerable to uh, uh, cases of this kind, which are full-fledged criminal cases, as any other kind of media platform. So the fact is that the experience of the last two or three years itself makes it very clear that digital media is not unregulated. Uh, it is not as if uh, somebody who is aggrieved by content uh, on a digital news platform uh, does not know where to turn, does not know which door to knock on. Because there are many examples of platforms like mine uh, which have been subjected to pressure of one kind or the other, uh, initiated on the basis of, uh, of complaints. And so this idea that uh, digital media needs to be regulated in some way because otherwise uh, there's not a level playing field is utter rubbish. But this is the logic on which, on which the government has, has proceeded in order to frame these IT rules, which are, to my mind, uh, not just offensive and um, you know they're offensive to the to the concept of press freedom, but they would they would, if they are allowed to stand, um, very shortly sound the death knell for for media freedom in this country because the idea is to weaponize uh, a system of complaints from so-called readers, and we know how uh, politically motivated groups of individuals often hand in glove or set in motion by the establishment or by the ruling party, uh, know how to play this game very well. They know how to wield this weapon very well. So you create uh, a situation where digital platforms have to comply with, a, with an illegal, in my mind, an unconstitutional, but ridiculously cumbersome grievance uh, addressal mechanism. And then essentially hold us, hold a gun to our head for, falling foul of that mechanism uh, if at the end of the day, a government committee decides that steps we have taken to address reader complaints are not adequate. 
So this represents a qualitatively new attack on uh, digital media. It of course builds on a decade long uh, establishment practice, you know, with the IT Act. I mean, the IT Act itself has lots of provisions which are misused. Section 66 may have been read down, but section 67, which prohibits the electronic transmission of obscene or lascivious material uh, has been used against all kinds of uh, legitimate uh, media expression against people on social media. So you, you, you can draw a cartoon that uh, uh, severely lampoons a chief minister or the prime minister, but would not be considered obscene if it were printed in a book or in a newspaper, because you have seven decades of jurisprudence on what constitutes obscenity. Uh, yet the police will say, because this cartoon has been disseminated electronically, it falls foul of the crime of the electronic dissemination of obscene material, and you get embroiled in a case. So, so there are lots of there were lots of landmines in the IT Act and other laws that could have been invoked and were invoked. But what we are seeing with the new IT rules is a qualitative escalation of this offensive. Now, we have gone to court. Other uh, digital media platforms have gone to court, and we are confident that when we have our day uh, and we are able to put our arguments before the judge, uh, the, the judiciary in India will see that this, uh, these rules represent an illegal and unconstitutional attempt to, to stifle freedom of press. And that's what we are, uh, where we are at right now. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I just want to take a brief pause and see if there are any questions. Aditi, I saw that you had a question. Um, maybe you want to ask that? Yes. Uh, thank you, Ria. Thank you, Access Now, for organizing this panel discussion. Uh, so this is following up on what Devi had asked. Is it possible to quantify the harms of clamping down of, on freedom of expression online as it is done with right to privacy? For instance, if there's a data breach, uh, there is still a fine imposed on the company. Is a similar thing possible here? Is there any kind of quantification possible? And the second question is to Mr. Vadrajan about is if the effect is only on solely digital media, like the wire, the scroll, the news minute, et cetera, or does it also take into its ambit things like the uh, website of the Indian Express or the Hindi? Because the latest letter that uh, was sent by the MIB on 26th May also has an appendix for legacy publishers to furnish their details. So if you can throw some light on that. Thanks, Aditi. Um, who would like to speak to the first question? Gaia, would you like, do you have any thoughts? Look, I mean, in most litigation, it's usually costs that's, um, that's, that's sort of um, calculated on, on different fronts, no? and that it's done by, quite differently. It's almost like how defamation is, is dealt with. No? Um, so it's not really possible to give one sort of yardstick or meter because it also then depends on a, a particular individual's reach and how much that content may or may not have reached. But I think Raman might probably be in a better position to, 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 to reflect on that particular question. Yes, Guy, I'm happy to try and answer it. And in fact, I think it might relate to Siddharth's experience as well. So it will be a good setup for him to maybe respond a bit to that and also the other question posed specifically to him. But for example, I think we need to remember that there are wide types of intermediaries. So the best example is those reporters or others who say regularly use commercial blogging platforms or providers to post their you know, work can literally be able to compute the harm that's caused to them by not re regularly reporting. Of course, any good journalist would say there's very little money in reporting, but there are ways you can compute and assess the impact it has on somebody's professional career. Uh, for those who are larger uh, services, and I know, for example, that's not happened very regularly in India, but say, imagine, you know, say the wire or other new services who exist who may use third party providers to serve to serve their data that means you know to either say host it or to run a content distribution network it is an interruption that they can talk about it the, the number of viewers who can't regularly access it and do a sense of computation about the sort of damage that is caused there of course the ultimate reality is at least in indian the indian context and, and so that emphasis look at past jurisprudence india doesn't really award damages at all it's the unfortunate reality of how our civil courts work but you can get a sense of that 
And of course, in public law, that is constitutional impact, judges take note of that seriously. But that's an initial sense of it. But it's very important for us to remember, as I keep saying, the number of people who have come to me to questions about the ITR tools over the last three to four weeks. It's not just even the news platforms, it's not even the big social media intermediaries. Every intermediary, every pipe in between, from telecom companies to content distribution network companies to cybersecurity companies to companies who service ads through ad networks, they're all impacted by it. They all don't know how it will be affecting them. And that entire internet economy is impacted. But of course, my larger concern is the human rights impact of that, which again, we can document and do. And perhaps India is interesting that way because there is some initial work or the social and economic cost of internet shutdowns. But again, I know Sadat might be able to talk about this a bit more along with the other specific question pointed to him. Yeah. So, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the question on, on quantifying damages and harms, uh, in 2015, uh, the Bombay High Court in uh, a case, uh, the case is called NSC versus Money Life, uh, awarded 50 lakhs, uh, 50 lakh rupees worth of damages to Money Life for uh, what was essentially a bogus defamation suit that they had brought against the publication. Uh, so there is a, uh, you know, a precedent uh, of uh, the courts awarding damages for, um, shall we say, um, you know, frivolous or uh, punitive, uh, you know, suits, uh, malified prosecutions of one kind or the other, civil suits. And the uh, Indian Criminal Court, I mean, the IPC, of course, also has provision uh, for going after public servants who engage in malicious prosecutions and so on. But those are very, very rarely invoked. And I don't think, um, even though many of the cases against us or the cases against, you know, for example, the sedition case against uh, Rajdeep Sardesai and uh, Brinal Pandey and others, uh, or the case against Dua, which the Supreme Court recently dismissed, uh, to my mind, in any democracy with rule and law, would, with, with rule of law, would be considered textbook cases of malicious prosecution, where uh, steep fines and even uh, more punitive measures against the erring police officials uh, ought to have been imposed. Uh, but, but we're pretty far from there right now. I mean, I would be happy at this stage if we are able to fight off some of the pressure uh, and some of the, some of the damage that is done to us. Uh, uh, later on, I think we can look to try to quantify and, and make a demand for punitive damages. Uh, on the second question, um, uh, you're right. I mean, the IT rules apply to everybody. They apply to uh, all digital media publishing. So that includes standalone digital publications like The Wire or uh, News Minute or Quint, Scroll, et cetera. It also applies to the websites of so-called legacy media, all TV stations, for example. And in fact, the biggest websites, the biggest digital news websites in terms of traffic in India are run by you know, NDTV, Times of India, Indian Express, and they all are required to comply with, this, uh, uh, with the IT rules. Uh, also included, I should add, are um, any website, because the rules are drafted in, with such vague language that it would apply to, I would say, uh, if you write a blog, uh, a regular blog on where you comment and analyze on current affairs, uh, the IT, the INB ministry could say, well, why aren't you registered with us? Where is your grievance officer? Because there is no mention of there's no limitation of scale in other words uh, there, there is no uh, floor for the minimum number of readers uh, that you have to have in order to comply with these rules and uh, uh, essentially they seem to be framed in such a way that the government can cherry pick so if you if you run a blog that has a huge amount of traffic and influence but is pro government uh, then chances are that your non compliance with the it rules will will go well below the radar but if you, if you are uh, somebody who writes a blog that is critical of the establishment, uh, no matter how small you are, you could very well run the risk of uh, punitive action by the government for this. And I should also say that foreign newspapers and websites uh, are not excluded. So the, the rule says that if you are a, a foreign publication that uh, is in the business of systematically providing your content uh, to people in India, then you have to comply. So the New York Times website is available. They, uh, the Guardian, 
um, at one time they used to have standalone India portals like India Inc and so on, but they don't do that now, but it doesn't matter. The fact is that they are very keen to expand their readership in India. They cover India extensively. They have offices and bureaus, uh, bureaus over here. And it's, there is a question mark as to whether they need to comply too. And uh, so, so this is uh, really uh, a very, very sweeping rule that can bring literally tens of thousands of publishers under its ambit, maybe even more. Why, for example, should your uncle's Facebook page, where he regularly posts comments and analysis about uh, elections and corruption and uh, uh, what's going on in the country, uh, surely that is also news and current affairs publication. Uh, so why should why would he be excluded from the need to have a uh, uh, a grievance officer, for example? Right. So uh, these are all ambiguities in the law which uh, you know, uh, I think have been left in there deliberately so that the government is armed with, an, with the ability to go after anybody that it wants. Uh, I should also add, if I, if I may, um, that the publishers of, uh, in other words, newspapers and TV channels are, you know, they met the minister and said, look, these rules shouldn't apply to us because we uh, already come under the ambit of the press council of India or the uh, broadcasting, uh, the broadcasting, you know, the Broadcast Act. And, um, you know, the, so there is some attempt by them to wriggle out as possible. The government may, may let them go. I don't know. Uh, but our response to that would be to say, well, if, if uh, Press Council of India is the regulatory body, then make it applicable to everybody. Why, uh, let them, uh, let their ambit cover newspapers as well as digital publishers and make it the Media Council of India. There is such a proposal floating around. Why do you need these IT rules uh, in order to, uh, you know, uh, so-called erect uh, the scaffolding of a regulatory system. So, so, so there's, a, there's plenty to argue about. And, you know, we hope to have all these issues get, uh, you know, uh, clarified in the course of our, uh, of our litigation and struck down as ultra-virus. Yeah, thank you for that. And just to, to talk about the really wide net that these rules are casting, and I think it's a good point to bring Sushant in. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit uh, about uh, Indian Kanun and the kinds of um, the kinds of order takedown orders that you've seen. Um, yeah. Hello, hello, Ria, and hello, everyone else. Uh, thanks for having me here. So I started Indian Kanun around 13, 14 years back. Uh, and my goal was just to make the search over Indian law and court judgments easier. So I just uh, crawled all crawled the Supreme Court website, got the laws and put them together. Uh, at that time, I did not know about all the problems that can come with it. So I thought it was just to make law finding easier. I was just doing PhD at that time and uh, did not thought, think about much of the ramifications. Later, I mean, even though the court cases are public documents, a lot of court cases came up regarding removal. But uh, most of those court cases were, dis uh, removals were actually went to court. And initially I did not have any representation in many of these cases, um, but only later on I realized that things can go wrong. And uh, I started having, uh, um, a point, I started having lawyers for those cases. But I think those are still the um, crux of that is the privacy versus people right to know. And uh, that is uh, something that uh, is not that direct harassment, though people have visited my house for case removal. And I mean, I have been summoned in Kerala High Court for a contempt case uh, for not following the order and uh, people have beaten me there also. So th that can also happen when court cases come up. Uh, but apart from that, I think there is a couple more interesting things that happen uh, while I run the website is, I mean, uh, Geo has, uh, Geo as an ISP has blocked Indian Kanun for around two, three days. Uh, somewhere, I think two, three years back. And uh, I mean, most of the people asked why that was blocked. They put up a notice saying, as per the instructions of MIT. And since these rules are actually uh, not supposed to, are supposed to be uh, hidden or so-called uh, the blocking, as per the blocking rules, they are not supposed to be given out. No one knows why the website was blocked. And later, I think around two, around after three days, 
Jio has uh, lifted the ban uh, on its own. Uh, I filed an RTI request. MIT did not give me anything saying why was the website uh, blocked. So, I mean, one of the big problems of uh, the the confidential nature of these blocking is that uh, um, no one knows the reason. No one has anything to challenge. I mean, you, since you don't have an order in front, you cannot go to the court to say this order is illegal. I mean, what are you going to challenge in the court? I mean, I think similar problems people find in the UAPA laws and similar security regulations where many of the things are in sealed envelopes and there is nothing to challenge. And the judge has to, you cannot really question, can't see the evidence that has been presented against you. So that is one big problem. And I think other than that, even the cybercrime police keep sending me messages for takedown of court orders. And I now it's, uh, I have got enough thick skin to just tell them, no, these are court orders and you need actually a court order to remove them. Uh, the intermediary liability rules were, uh, I mean, are really weaponized now as that said. The, uh, I mean, I have claimed in all my previous cases to be an intermediary because I'm just an intermediary of court publishing their uh, laws. So uh, in that respect, if I qualify as an intermediary, but now the rules are such that the takedown notices by government are really weaponized, that you need to have a grievance redressal uh, mechanism. And um, the definition is also so broad uh, of what qualifies as a news media or not, that even some may say that Indian Kwanun also qualifies because it uploads daily court judgments. So that is... Um, what I feel are the problems with uh, this. And uh, I mean, I being a single person running the website was also a lot of ramifications because people coming down to the home is also not, I mean, it, it hasn't had uh, any inadvertent experience yet, but it may have. And that is why I will always kept my address secret till now uh, for that reason. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Sushanta. That, you know, against that context, it's also uh, important to note uh, that Live Law Challenged um, has filed a challenge and has got a, a temporary injunction against the rules being enforced against them. So that's a really important point. I mean, there's a there's a question that I wanted to pose, actually building on something that you said, you know, is that a, a lot of the coverage is framing this as a battle between, you know, big tech and the government. And I think the government is also keen to kind of frame it as that. Um, you know, who else is kind of, uh, caught up in this battle, you know, and what are the kind of consequences of that? Who, who is this question to? Um, who'd like to take it? Uh, Gaia, would you like to take it? Yeah, yeah so, um, so for in actually, it's a really good question about this, this particular set of rules has, as I said, broadened the uh, like ambit of who is intermediary, right? Now OTTs, uh, digital me uh, media uh, portals have all come into this. Now, actually the bigger question now becomes this big Facebook, Twitter size um, platforms versus emerging alternatives, right? Already we've recognized that, and this goes back to the question that Devi had actually initially asked about remedial measures. And I, I had messaged her saying that remedial measures has little to do with the law and more to do with how these companies operate um, and the monopoly that they enjoy, no? I mean, there is no alternative, uh, effective alternative at the moment for some of them. So for alternatives to emerge, small and medium sort of enterprises need to be able to survive. Now, what these rules effectively do is that they make it near impossible. Like for an organization like India Kanon, which is very well reputed, as you heard from Sushan, it's already sort of daunting you know, to deal with all of these. Imagine a startup trying to engage in... Um, in, in, in this content space, the kind of burden that's going to fall on them, the amount of compliance that they would have to go for, they are not going to ruffle the feathers of the government. No, they, they, what they would actually end up doing is over compliance. And what, what would happen is they will preempt a situation where they might have to face the government. So they'll proactively start taking down content that is even mildly problematic. So that is actually what will happen. And that is the, that is the environment that these, this current rules is going to foster. Raman, uh, is there anything to add on that? 
And I was just curious, so Sushant's view, because I know like he's often on this, seeing the directly and directly also often, you know, his contents indexed by other big tech players. So he sees the sort of tension they face. So I actually want to ask Sushant what he thought about this. I mean, the, uh, I mean, the framing the debate as big tech versus uh, government is not the right debate, right? I mean, you are including everyone in the intermediary section. This is doesn't, doesn't, I mean, of course, in the new section, you expand that ambit even more. And you go to the OTT, you expand that even more. And uh, I mean, the, the rules, if, even in the other segment um, that applies to all the intermediary are not lightweight rules. The, the grievance redressal has to be immediate almost. And uh, uh, within 24 hours, I mean, I usually take two, three days to actually implement a court order because I have work lined up and uh, other things to deal with. Uh, so even court order for me takes two, three days at least to get done. Um, if they are going to ask 24 hour removal and things like that, then <laughs> I, I think it's a very difficult for anyone to operate in that way. And I would briefly add to Sushant is the, it's very important to note the requirements for significant social media intermediaries that can also include not for profit entities who do this, including perhaps the communication channels on, say, Wikimedia or other platforms. Uh, there's a data retention requirement for over half a year. So, in fact, there are A, imagine the cost, but also imagine platforms who say, yeah, we don't want to enable that because that is incredible harm on privacy on many other measures of example like imagine focus people focused on supporting journalists or others who would never keep data for that long except related to a particular story and also in a, in a secure manner it's directly in fact meant to facilitate surveillance but also in, incredibly uh, intrusive and damaging on the right to privacy not to mention digital security more, more generally Yeah, thanks for that. I think we haven't um, talked about a lot of the privacy harms that these that these rules um, can introduce. Um, I see that I wanted to check if there's any more questions. I see Aditi has a question uh, to Gaia. Aditi, would you like? Uh, thank you, Ria. Uh, Ria. So uh, Gaia, the question is that the rules and the code don't really expand the definition of intermediaries, do they? Instead, they rather create a new category of publishers of online curated content or publishers of news and current affairs content. And while they may overlap in terms of function, for instance, uh, if the wire has a comment section, for the comment section, it becomes an intermediary. And for the news article itself, it's a publisher of news and current affairs content. But there have been attempts to silo the two. And therefore, also silo the obligations there? Or did I misread something? I just want to flag that. I think we lost Kai in between. Oh, yeah. maybe sure. But if she's rejoining, because she warned me, if there's anything that goes towards on legal stuff, you, I, I would be her backup if there are connection issues. I can try and answer. That would be OK. Uh, Aditi, I apologize. When Kai is back, she can try and answer as well. But I can do my best. Uh, and I think your point is absolutely valid. The rules technically do something worse. They categorize. They <laughs> That's not what parliament intended. Parliament was very clear. It said there's this one definition of intermediary, which is very broad. And just by way of brief history, that's because everyone asked to be an intermediary back in 2005, um, when the rule, the process to amend the act happened after the famous Bazi case, where Anish Bajaj was arrested, because people said the purpose of this parent section, section 79, is to give legal protection, is to give a qualified legal immunity if you're an intermediary involved in handling other people's data, communication messages, and you don't have full control. Uh, and therefore, because that was a protective section, everyone rushed in to be included in that definition. And ultimately, that's what parliament signed off on. MPs, in their wisdom in those three minutes that were there to you know, clear the IT Act amendments, you know, put that in. Now, what they've done is they've created a subcategorization. So they basically, the executive branch has gone ahead and basically perverted what parliament did, to create a broad definition, subcategorize it, and put so many burdens there, which I think was what like, Sushant was saying, right? You now hesitate to say you're an intermediary because it actually makes your life much worse. And people who a couple of years ago in the tech sector who would have said, yeah, obviously we're intermediary, they're careful. Because for example, are significant social media intermediaries, telecom players as well, who may have social media functions now embedded, like every telco has a sort of social network uh, sort of embedded in their payments platform or whatever, right? Like Abhati Airtel reminds me of my family who are there, how to communicate. Are the full mandates on them as well? And I think that's what's happened there. But he's absolutely right. 
the the rules didn't expand the definition of intermediary but they perverted the purpose of it and by subclassifying it they created it uh, and expanded its scope in a massive way and one thing they did do is the rules try to cast within their ambit digital news publishers and, and others somehow within the definite if not the definition of intermediaries within the government's rule making powers for intermediaries which is completely improper and just to like leave one last point i think it's a struggle with the ministry of electronics and it uh, during previous administrations but it's gotten worse with this administration is that the it act is not their constituent assembly they can't do anything they want there it's a limited law passed by parliament as that mentioned which already has problems in it but it's a law where you have limited rule making power for example under the it act i can't say that oh you know riya singh sani cannot appear on the internet at all for any reason because her name is that you have to go with clear intent or limitation and that doesn't seem to be purpose the idea is let's put in as much as we can because otherwise we'll have to go to parliament and they probably will get that law anyway in parliament if they did do that but they saying we don't even want to go through the pretense of that process yeah thanks for that raman we're almost at the mark um, we have a little bit of leeway to extend if there are any more questions so i just wanted to check beatrice uh, please you're on uh, a mute sorry you're on mute yeah apologies uh, my name is beatrice i work for the bbc in the united kingdom um it's perhaps a question for raman we've talked a lot about the role of digital content platforms but taking a step further in terms of the role of isps and mobile phone companies what evidence is there to date that they have pushed back on any unlawful requests or overly broad requests so i can share based on my experience talking to different isps and working in in industry and currently is that they do try and push back on requests some of them are publicly on record when websites and ship orders were issued in india even during the 2005 to 2009 period particularly when at one point of time blogspot was blocked and in fact that is probably a defining moment where because that is so public and the pushback was so strong the government felt stung by it and i think the telecom industry told them that look don't do this again because this is what you're going to get um they i think have tried to told, tell them that in the context of internet shutdowns as well but that's a separate topic but what i can share is for example conversations where people in telecom industry have said well actually you know we prevented them from doing horrible things sometimes but they don't really review what they send us we have tens of thousands of website blocking of websites that we have blocked over the years and we are not even uh, directed to clean them up and it's a struggle and for example one uh and for the company the company said that it actually impacts network performance it impacts our filters and what we deploy there and our users suffer because we are still implementing block lists that are out of date um what i think you'll notice is that when it comes to elements about the blocking rules etc the sector overall has tried to put some pressure back on the government they said we prefer court orders coming to us but they had this general position which is that we are licensed by the government of india beyond a point we cannot push back on them tremendously because they can just say you're not following a like an order sent by the government that itself is a violation of the license condition even if the order is not lawful and their risk appetite on that is low and part of this i think also has been sometimes they put the issue on to online platforms and they say look don't send the blocking orders to us send it to them and get more regulatory power ironically by passing these rules the situation where everybody has gotten worse because these rules also apply to telcos isps edge providers content distribution networks you know all those sorts of actors as well and they are wondering oh how do we actually now implement this do we retain data for up to 6 months if we have large amounts of data we keep do we uh, do we have to appoint a compliance officer in india if it is cdn or other things like that and i think that's quite striking thank you i'll just like to add one thing here so so in um, in uh, uh, some time back uh, i think mitsu actually uh, was contacted by some influential people to bring down indian kanun uh, and then the mitsu actually called me that time to check uh, what is happening and uh, they actually cross verified with me that uh, nothing is uh, illegal here Uh, and uh, in the way the other side has presented was that as if indian kanun was doing something illegal and the domain registrar needs to bring it down so that happens again yeah thanks thanks for that um i was just wondering if there's any more questions um uh, does anybody want to give any sort of final final words as we wrap up maybe i can go 
to see that first? Yeah, no, I think it's great that RightsCon has flagged this uh, uh, because I think worldwide there needs to be greater awareness and discussion of the very precarious position that media freedom in general and digital media uh, freedoms in particular are, are, are in. Uh, and if this is happening in a, in a democracy with uh, rule of law, uh, then clearly uh, the writing on the wall for the rest of the world is not very good. And, uh, you know, we uh, at The Wire, like many other digital uh, platforms and other journalists and editors and publishers who are committed to media freedom intend to fight this. And we are very confident that, uh, that we will uh, get our day in court and prevail because uh, at the end of the day, there is such an intimate link between media freedom and digital freedoms on the one hand and democracy on the other, that the courts are going to recognize this and are going to say that in order to defend democracy in India, it's essential that uh, there be no compromise with media freedom. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Gaia, I think you're back. Uh, but your camera yeah, I'm on my phone, so I don't have my camera on. Um, I would actually make two points, is uh, that I think there needs to be more engagement. Actually, India is quite lucky because we have we have like a lot of really advanced um, digital rights groups um, like SFLC, Internet Freedom Foundation, several. I, I, I can go naming. No, so we are actually lucky in comparison to other uh, jurisdictions. We have quite a lot of experts. We also have digital rights uh, uh, experts beyond organizations, lawyers that that understand the digital realm. But what is actually needed is a lot more engagement with the legal development in the regulatory framework beyond from a, beyond a legal perspective. There needs to be a sociological perspective. And therefore, I hope that the media, that civil society engages more with uh, digital uh, regulatory developments. That's on the one hand. But as far as the political scenario goes, I feel that state governments, provincial governments, need to start engaging the union government more um, and not play such a passive role in how the internet is regulated uh, because it has an impact on the lives of people and state governments have a responsibility to safeguard that and not leave all of this just in the hands of, of sort of uh, the union government, I would say. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Finally, Sushant, if you had any final comments. I mean, sort of mean the mean the problem of um, as uh, um, I mean the new rules aren't addressing the big tech problems or the hate related issues that are really there. I mean the new rules are just weaponizing government control over what can be given out or what can be available online. So in that respect, the rules are nothing to do with actually controlling the big tech. I mean, it is just to, it is just to make sure all platforms actually obey what government does. And which is very um, different perspective on what free speech should be on. So I think the new rules should be just completely taken down and uh, new, uh, and new some, uh, new approach should be taken on what to do with hate speech and other problems that happen due to, and the law and uh, order problems that happen. This is, this is uh, not needful at all. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. And it goes to something Gaia mentioned at the beginning also that, yeah. you know, this is really not really help. It's not going to help. Uh, it's probably going to disproportionately affect um, communities that are already at risk uh, and already face a lot of hate speech online. Mm -hmm. Um, Raman, I was wondering if you had any final comments or additional questions. I'm just very you know, glad of our fantastic panel and people who've been here. And I think what people should also note and take away is this, the fact that this is so important. And I was just struck by the fact that India has come up in the comments of two significant tech company, you know, executives who've spoken at RightsCon in the comments of Matthew Prince, who noted that, in fact, between the sometimes polarized positions of China and the United States, He's been looking at two other nodes for like influence and regulation, which is the European Union doing things in a careful, considered way. Not all is right, but like doing it in a careful manner. And he in fact said, 
India was perhaps the most important one he was looking at, very, very important, but one which he was very concerned was taking a position actually much more closer to the sort of authoritarian position that some people in China take, which was troubling him. And that troubled me as an Indian who tracks and knows the impact India can have on democracies globally, which David K talked about, Siddharth has also talked about, others have talked about the impact we have in the region. And I think therefore there's a burden on all Indian policymakers, whether those who serve in the elected central government, Prime Minister Modi, his ministers and the civil servants who, who aid him and were appointed to public office, judges, regulators, whoever might be there to fix this and particularly immediately put pause and perhaps rewind on these IT Act rules to fix other measures in terms of the broken sense system we have for web censorship in India, the first step of addressing a problem is acknowledging we have a problem and then going towards talking about it and fixing it. And then taking our sort of position where India truly, I think, can shine globally as a, the sort of champion for free expression, democracy that we wish to be. And also an effective rights respecting approach to regulating big tech. You know, I would have preferred a 2021 where we had a strong data protection and privacy law, an independent privacy commission, strong protections of government you know, surveillance and national security measures, and a approach to regulating big tech that other democracies would be tempted to follow. And instead we have following situation where other democracies at the very least should avoid or learn the mistakes of what India has been doing the last few months. But again, there's space to change this and I hope that can be done. And I think it takes all of us to engage more. And I just wanted to thank people for taking time out to talk about this, because I think we all care very deeply on this topic, whether we're in the press, activism, tech, or wider communities tracking not just the future of the internet, but the present of the internet. India is the second largest internet user base in the world. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and thanks everybody for joining us today and giving us time. Um, I'm just going to put the email um, in case anybody has any more questions that they didn't manage to ask. Um, otherwise, that's it. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. See you.